in, in kind of current economic climate, that in, in this kind of neoliberal economic order, performative performance is somehow known. That we are expected to be much performative character, we are expected to be flexible, we have to you know, adapt to situation, and, and um, we are uh, expected to be several things at the same time, somehow. And um, and this what you um, the ones you produce in the seventies, especially these kind of all these pieces where you uh, form into a character that's somehow co-opted by um, I would say conservative economic position. And my question is, how do you maintain criticality in performance in this current climate of performativity? No fucking idea. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? I have no idea what to say. <laughs> Got any ideas? Not on the top of my head. <laughs> For uh, Do you have an answer? Or do well, you want to share your thoughts? Like, where did the question come from? Like, well, um, in my mind, say what's happening in, in Britain today, in fact, what you call situation in Britain, where Conservative Prime Minister is telling the citizen that you have to be a volunteer. You can't just be a worker, but you have to be a volunteer. You have to be green as well to be conservative. And um, and um, and of course, being an artist is already kind of performance somehow, and that you have to perform an artist, and if you're a performance artist, you have to perform an artist who perform somehow. And, and I'm, I mean, this is just a really kind of loose thought, but what is a like, possibility of refusing to perform? How can you refuse performance? And how, what is, where, where does performance break down? Like, where, what is kind of failed performance? And, uh, and this, I mean, all this is still quite like a really fragmented thought, but um, yeah. Um, do you mean like kind of when you say that in regard to your work? I was really thinking also about this idea maybe of the of your impersonations of the first ladies, this moment of comedy that probably subversively breaks down that neoliberal demand of daily performativity and creativity of the citizen. You know, somehow that it's that taking on that persona mm -hmm. of this ideal model mm -hmm. in which these women are mm -hmm. yeah. cast it to be. They tell you how, you know, fancy where you can dress and right. <laughs> you know, I mean, this kind of, all, many, many issues, the good, yeah. the good mother, whatever. That that, was, was there a moment what was your decision to do comedy? Because I remember reading mm -hmm. somewhere that Marsha Tucker was doing stand-up comedy. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this does actually really yeah. have the stand-up comedy quality yeah. today. Like, you know, Tina Fey doing Sarah Palin. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you know, I, you know, she did this many, many years before. Yeah. And it's just interesting the power of that. Do you think that's yeah. Like, what did the comedy The uh, condition that we live in is an absurd, is absurd, place and there is no way to resolve it ever so you do have to laugh otherwise you'll go nuts <laughs> but that's then you know well well my sense too is you know obviously what you're doing is taking on the, the camouflage skin of your oppressor um, and that's where humor is a really really great device um, because these were the people that were the, the generals in the culture war against yeah. you. And you're, you're uh, from a, a woman's point of view, it may be their female persona <coughs> and just sticking it back to them. But that is the one device. If you couldn't fight back through the courts or you couldn't fight back through all these other labor intensive administrative things, you heard mm -hmm. and use that as the device to, to um, well, Tipper Gore lives on through you. 
in many ways, but it's Martha Wilson's version of what Tipper Gore was. So that is the performative moment with the record. And then, you know, the fact that, well, I'm, I'm kind of proud of the moment where I put all three Barbara Bushes together on one compilation tape, because they were all in death out of disparate tapes, and to get them all into one so you can see all the stages of Barbara Bush being the wife of the president, and the mother of the president, and then the mother of the soon to be ex president. And just to see how that historical narrative is a really interesting trope. So I just, you know, urge you to just sit and watch the three Barbara Bushes. And there's like, what, 15, 20 years of American history filtered through Martha Wilson. So that's a performative uh, point of don't get mad, get even, and leave a really good record. Uh, I was thinking of what he was talking about the failure that that in by dressing up as as Barbara Bush, it's an imperfect copy because at some level we know okay it looks like Barbara Bush but it's not quite right and somehow that failure is what brings into like a that you see that oh that everything she's saying also kind of has that kind of pastiche that so it makes you more aware when the real Barbara Bush is talking mm. that. Well, it's still ridiculous what she's mm -hmm. saying, mm -hmm. but by having the, the imperfect copy, and which is also comes again with the photographs and all of these, because you're not really miserable, you're just pretending to be miserable. <laughs> you know, so that, you know that, that it's bringing into like a sort of sharper relief what's going on by, by having the comedy, that kind of failure. And that's what's funny. It's like, well, it's not really Barbara Bush, mm. therefore it's funny. Aspect of failure on purpose. As a good thing. Yes, as a good thing. Um, my question is about Irving Goldman. I really about Irving Goldman that mentioned. I really appreciate that you mentioned him because in my own uh, Work, I try to link uh, his thought with performance art and the way uh, in his text uh, representation and staging and roles became central and uh, the way in which at the same time in performance art uh, social everyday life became central. So I have no idea whether you have read him or not or whether he was influential. So that would be what you would. And, and could you maybe precise in which way he influenced you or in which way so his kind of sociological thought uh, was or not uh, influencing yes. at the time? Sure. For oh. uh, specifically in um, Premier, which is not the right now. Um, uh, 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 appearance is value. Uh, if, you, if you act in a way, this goes back to the introvert extrovert discussion. If you act in a way that you would like to feel, but you don't feel, if you ad enact that pattern, you can have access to the feelings that you don't actually feel. So in, in one of these uh, performances, I, I'm saying, um, OK, I would like to be calm. So I'm going to look calm, and I arrange myself to look calm, <laughs> and then assert that I am an artist, even though you know, in my heart I have all these misgivings about whether I can claim to be an artist. So. Uh, it was a it was a um, direct rip off of his thought that that we we enact and rehearse um, feelings that we that we don't actually have in order to occupy those spaces. I'm so cu curious how um, how Lucy Lepard was so critical in framing you as being such an advocate 
of the feminist art movement. And I'm curious, when you moved to New York and when you started Franklin Furness, and I had a note of Jackie Apple and like your your vision of her as a professional in the arts field. And I'm curious how becoming administrative in Franklin, in Franklin Furness and in meeting someone as Jackie Apple in your collaboration with her, if you still continue, how that affected your artwork and your position in feminist art in your role. Okay. Uh, well, the first thing I want to say about Jackie is that she uh, was a fashion designer. She designed fashion. She had a beautiful hairdo. She wore makeup. She had wore heels, dresses. She had this, this shop where she would draw the pattern, and then other people would cut the pattern and sew it up. Um, and honestly, I thought um, because she did not look like a feminist that she couldn't be smart. Although I had read her stuff. You know, that there was this idea that you can't look like that and be a feminist that was out there at the time. We were arguing all the time about, uh, first of all, what is feminism anyway, and what does a feminist look like, and how does a feminist act? We, we had not uh, agreed, and what uh, we were going to discuss in the class yesterday, we never really got around to, was that the, the beauty of the WAC show was that it, it demonstrated that there were 12 camps, perhaps, in the feminist art movement. There were the, the goddess people, there were the pattern people, there were the identity folks, there was the, you know, there were all these different um, warring concepts of what it was to be creating feminist art. Uh, that was the first part. I can't remember the second part of your question. Oh. I think uh, how you changed to an administrative role. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, I resented being an administrator uh, for the first couple of years. I was just working all the time. I was living in the in in the store, living up on the mezzanine, and Franklin Furnace was downstairs. Uh, so I would wake up, start working go to sleep and stop working. <coughs> there was no reason to not work because of the <coughs> it's right there. Um, I complained to my friend Ann Folk, who was the founder of Ann Orr Gallery in Seattle, and she said, well, you know, why don't you consider your administrative practice to be a creative practice since we have to use our wits and come up with uh, new answers every day and remain flexible and adaptable to the circumstances as they change, uh, which is what you do as an artist, uh, which was a, another liberating moment when, when uh, but, but I should say that by 1981, I figured out I had to move out of Franklin Furnace or I was gonna die. Um, so I'm, I'm an American living in Canada, which is fun and <laughs> strange. <laughs> um, but I was just wondering how, how much influence place had on your work. Uh, I know that you were younger when you were in Halifax, and that must have obviously had influence in the kind of things you were creating. But because um, like I, I've recently moved here, so I'm just totally experiencing a different country, and it's radically shifted my approach to art and. Um, yeah, I wonder if you moved back to Canada, and, and if, or if you, when you were in Europe, if, when you ex how you experienced those shifts in, in nation, especially since some of your work is so political. Um, if you ever tapped into a kind of a global clim climate of, of, of that politic, or, or if um, it was specific to nation. At the end of the uh, I didn't know it was the end of my time in Kennedy, but um, Richard Nixon 
was on the TV every day uh, because the Watergate hearings were going on, and Canada had better coverage of the Watergate hearings than the United States did. In Canada, we could watch gavel to gavel coverage, and in the United States, we just excerpted the high points of the day. Uh, and I was stripping um, paint off the baseboards of the house on Pepperell Street and watching gavel to gavel coverage of the Watergate hearings and thinking, I'm missing out on an important chapter in American history. And so, after Richard Stump, I asked that I just, I moved back. I wanted to be as horrible as I thought the country was acting. I felt I'm an American and I, I need to be here for this. Also, it snowed on May 12th of that spring. <laughs> that would do it. <laughs> just a slight bookend on that. One of the reasons why I've been very interested in this whole subject with just Vietnam War and just the politics of that period was I was a very young and naive 17 year old when I went to a school in Michigan in 1974 and uh, spent four years in the American college system in the Midwest. And Grand Rapids was the home of Gerald R. Ford, the one who became president after Nixon and all of that. So I've been always fascinated from the Canadian point of view, living in the Midwest and experiencing republicanism in the Midwest yeah. and just everything that that means, then coming back to Canada and kind of parsing the difference. So this whole area has been my total curiosity from my point of view. It's different. The, just what the border is, the framing, the media, uh, even feminism as subject matter, how it mm. emerged in different ways. And I could go through a list of people in Canada that are seen as major you know, cultural political figures, and a good 60% of them are American that did come to Canada because of the Vietnam War. Mm. And uh, Tanya Mars, who's originally from Michigan, Detroit, <coughs> she uh, coined, or she mentioned one time, she says, a lot of the uh, expatriate Americans that are in Canada from the Vietnam era are, and this is her words, more Canadian than the Canadians. Mm -hmm. So it's a really interesting point just, just to analyze and even uh, looking at what femin fem the feminism is from a Canadian point of view versus how it was completely, you know, absolutely rejected from an, an American Midwestern Republican point of view. There are a lot of really interesting zones to still critique and look at. Um, I, I know we're kind of moving along here, but I want to just open the conversation to Martha on the uh, story with the Franklin Furnace and about the administrative uh, duties and responsibilities, but how you, in that position, even though you weren't, as you say, curating it, you were fully the enabler of the programming that happened there. So if you just want to talk about the various like highlights in your mind, and some of them are part of the exhibition next door, about the, the performance that happened at Franklin Furnace that also got you into trouble with the religious right and culture wars. But just to speak to that process, it's a form of activism through administration by making a space for things to happen. And you, your, your classic phrase for Franklin Furnace is making the avant-garde Oh, you say Make, making the world safe for Albert Garner. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, so just speak about that again. Um, as someone who went through this entire investigative, uh, introverted process in Halifax, and then becomes you know the Uber enabler in New York for an entire species of performance, open the doors for all kinds of feminist investigation. Uh. In, in the 70s, we were allowed to do whatever we damn well pleased, and we were even given money from the NEA to do it. And then Ronald Reagan was elected president in 1980. And we didn't quite get it in the beginning, but he, through his henchman, the chair of the NEA, Frank Hotzel, was intent on dismantling support for individual artists so that we, the individual artists, would shut up and, and uh, not be a cultural inf uh, influence. Um, first to go was the Critics Fellowships, right away. Uh, 
but we still didn't understand what was going on. Frank Furness did the Carnival Show in 1984. The religious right at the time was laughable, laughable, I'll use that word. Um, they were, we didn't understand how powerful they were going to be. They were still laughable in our minds, although we, um, were accused of showing pornography to 500 children a day, and then they, let's see, the, the vice chair, the deputy chair, Hugh Southern, and the director of the visual arts program came to New York to meet with me and my couple of members of my board um, to say, oh, would you please not thank the NEA for everything that you do, just thank the NEA for the specific program that gave you the money. Um, this was the beginning of, we used to get money for the entire program, and we were allowed to select what was in the program, but they were moving towards uh, program-based funding, which means you submitted in advance the fact that you were planning to show Andy Sprinkle, and then they could say no, uh, so that the NEA's name wouldn't be linked with Andy Sprinkle later on. Um, that was 1984. By 1990, Karen Finley, well, Karen Finley did a performance at Franklin Furnace in 1983, her first in New York, uh, taking a bath in a suitcase, making love to a chair, using Wesson cooking oil um, with her husband, who was uh, one of the Kipper kids. Uh, he, was, he had white face all over his body except for a G-string, and he was wearing a, an Indian bonnet. But this was um, completely fine and went down without comment. It was standard downtown fare. Uh, that was 1983. By 1990, she had been identified as the chocolate smeared young woman by two conservative newspaper columnists for a performance that she had done called um, Constant State of Desire. Uh, in which she is naked, she's smearing, well, she's not naked, actually, she's wearing underpants and tube socks. She's smearing chocolate frosting on her breasts, then sprinkling bean sprouts on top of that, and then glitter on top of that, to embody the denigration of women in, in American society, in world, in society, period. Uh, so she became the chocolate smeared young woman. Then um, she applied to Franklin Furness to do an installation because she was now well known as a performance artist. We were showing emerging artists. We got money from Jerome Foundation to show emerging artists, and she made the case that her work as a visual artist, as an installation person, was emerging. So we said, yeah, okay. So she came to Franklin Furness and did an installation called a woman's life isn't worth much. In 1990, drawing uh, stories directly on the wall, the story of Aunt Mandy who died from an abortion, um, the story of how if you don't shave your legs, you won't get the job, uh, why can't this veal calf walk. Um, John, by this point, Frank Hansel was gone and John Frommeyer was the director of the NEA, I called him up and said, why don't you come to New York and see that this work is not obscene. Uh, but he declined. He uh, didn't want to be associated with Franco Furness. And actually, later he lost his job because he supported Sapphire. Sapphire, who did a poem called Wild Thing. It was from the point of view of the rapist. Uh, there was a, a, a an incident in Central Park, uh, a young black man raped a white jogger in Central Park, and the poem was from his point of view, and he thought it was a work of art and valid, and he lost his job over that. Uh, Frank, let's see, John Frommeyer, okay, so he declined to come. Uh, we heard from People for the American Way, which was a liberal group in Washington that we should be careful around the opening of, of um, Karen's show. They didn't know what was going to happen, but they, they, there was chatter on the right-wing uh, circuits. 
So I invited the whole board and the opening went off okay. And then I went out to dinner with one of my board members. Uh, somebody came to the performance following Karen's opening. It was Diane Tours, a River Styx performance in the basement. Left early, found a locked exit, and turned in Franklin Furnace as an illegal social club. We returned, uh, you know, the, the uh, lieutenant of the fire department came the next night. I said, no, please come. We have 75 people sitting on hard falling chairs. We never have more than 75 people. Please come and see how we run this thing. And, um, he found a statute on the books that uh, you cannot exit past a boiler room. We've been exiting past a, our boiler room for 17 years at that point, which um, we were closed for. So now the performance space is closed. And we, we started to um, go into a crisis mode thinking, what, what uh, is our response going to be now that the space is closed, now that the performance space which was in the basement is closed. Uh, so the board and I decided to go into exile. That was, you know, not give up the program at all, but take it into other people's spaces. Uh, that had two means of egress and had um, panic bars on the doors. Uh, the first year in exile was at Judson Memorial Church, which I thought was a nice touch because Judson Memorial Church is where um, Yvonne Rader wrapped her naked body in an American flag in 1970. It was the cradle of the avant-garde, uh, which we were the, you know, the descendants. Uh, the year after that was Cooper Union, then we went to the new school for a couple of years. Um, and then <coughs> sold the largest collection of artist books in the United States uh, to the Museum of Modern Art, and then figured out, oh, the venue is really not that important. The, program is what is important. The program could happen in all kinds of different venues. It doesn't have to happen in any particular place. You know, it's great when art is so exciting that people start yelling. What's he yelling about? So, the religious right is responsible for art going virtual. In a, you know, that's a long way to say. So. How would you describe the climate today? Performance art has oh. become so popular. Yeah. There's a different administration. Yeah. Do you think Karen Finley could perform her performance at MoMA, hmm. for example? Hmm. Like, what do you think? Do you think that would be that what a great idea? idea. <laughs> well, it, as, a, as a heritage performance, oh, they, they would go with that in a minute, right? Fine. No, but I mean, just the, you know, with the board of the, you yeah. know, I mean, all these boards are so political, so like with yeah. the board, with, with the, could that even happen? I'm not, you know, I think. Uh, performance art was alive and well during this whole period when the NEA was trying to defund individual artists, and especially performance artists. Performance artists were performing in bars, in the Lower East Side, and in the street, and online. They started to figure out, then flash mobs came into being, and regular people uh, started to try to overthrow the Iranian government using their cell phones. You know, performance artists is doing fine in an overall sense. But in the, in the New York art world, uh, C car was fired, and slowly but surely, some of the venues closed down. Uh, performance art became, it didn't disappear, but it became uh, more constrained over the course of, uh, between the 1970s, you know, the, the heyday to uh, the 2000, the turn of the millennium. But then, Marina Brunkwich did her 70s and pieces at, at the Guggenheim, and the whole idea of recreation 
appeared. Um, and uh, we got our first proposal ever from an artist who wanted to recreate performances by Shigeko Kubota and Lamont Young, uh, which we funded that year, um, 2006. Uh, now, because Marina Abramovich did her retrospective at MoMA and did that performance a month, six, six week long performance in the atrium, uh, performance art is the, hobby, you know, the hottest topic around. And um, and the other thing, well, I, I, there were a few there were a few things that led to that moment. I think the uh, creation of Performa by Rosalie Goldberg, a, a biannual festival of performance art. Well, she actually she says she calls it visual art performance, and she doesn't always call performance artists into the mix. She calls artists who are visual artists into uh, her arena and then asks them to do something performative, which is a little different. So what I do when I collaborate with her, because we've been trying to hold up the other end of the problem by showing the history of performance art in the last 30 years, in addition to the current practice, as a, as a uh, complementary uh, offering to Performa. I shouldn't put this on tape, should I? <laughs> Rosalie and I don't agree on a lot of things. I'll just leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But the, the good news is that performance art is the hottest thing in the art world right now. That, that is what's going on. And uh, that's, that's it. I just wonder if it makes the climate more tolerant, you know? Or if it actually, sometimes these things become very hot and trendy, and they actually have a kind of backlash um, effect to it that it'll make people, you know, actually be more concerned, or fi you know, finally they'll find something to really pinpoint again yeah. and scandalize. Yeah. It's, it's this, is it the desire for the scandal? I'm not using the word spectacle, or is it, you know, she's going to have that uh, force. Well, sure. Sure. You can talk about that. Um, about Bronson. Well, I, I, my immediate observation is that with the Rommel this is, I found it interesting you called it heritage for performance and that it is already within museum culture so it is reviewing something that's already happened. What I think is really important is what's happening at uh, you know, the street level, the college level, the artist run center level, that there's no censorship at that level because that's the new layer of current production as opposed to the museological uh, enhancement or endorsement, shall we say. Um, but just uh, this is a segue to, to A, what everyone has to be perpetually vigilant about it is things that happen in culture. Sometimes there's a grand gesture, it's the shutting down program or the police raid or whatever, but more often than not, I'm um, kind of looking at Michelle Terrio on this one, it's the subtle stuff that happens in programming directives or what happens at Canada Council or what happens at Canadian Heritage where they change the percentages of what you can do in terms of applying for contemporary programming. And what we're just noticing very subtly within the current uh, economic and cultural environment is that there's, shall I say it, more of an enhancement towards uh, museum-endorsed culture and uh, kind of the subtle slipping to the side of current contemporary production. So we're, as administrators, and Mars has been very articulate about that, sometimes the real war happens at the administrative level about where are, where's the funding that comes that permits us to make things happen at the you know street production artist studio level whatever you want to say because that's where the culture is really being made it's being i won't use the word packaged but it's being discussed and put into uh, dissemination mode through our gallery structures and these form of conversations we have been very fortunate thus far in canada to have a funding culture that permits uh, federal, provincial, local monies to create these forms. Um, I think 
your socks were knocked off when you found out you were getting a fee for being here. Um, there are no such things as the exhibition fees and artist fees in the American system. It's completely market-based. The gallery gives you or bestows on you the space to, you know, it's up to you to be brilliant, but then your money is going through, through the sale, through, through market. So there are very many cultural differences that we're talking about, and yet there's a lot the same in terms of politics and what is permitted to happen. Um, and AA, Bronson, I'm sure you're aware of just what's developed in Washington with the Smithsonian, where he has, in his own inimitable manner, problematized a whole bunch of issues by asking to have his work that uh, is owned by the National Gallery pulled from the exhibition in the Smithsonian in protest to the fact that another artist's work was pulled by the directors or by the curators after uh, extreme pressure from um, a very right-wing Catholic group. Uh, that the right-wing Catholic group is now this uh, allowed, or I'm using the wrong word, that they're being uh, yeah, disavowed by the uh, other members of the Catholic Church. So the, what A has done is said it's his intellectual property even though it's owned by the National Gallery, so he's problematizing that whole artist copyright issue about who owns the intellectual content versus who owns the object. So I think he's being very cheeky and provocative, but he's also, you know, pointing to the various fractures and lines of friction that there is in all the various layers of how a work goes from an artist's mind through to production of objects, through to the intellectual market, and I view galleries solely as an intellectual market where you're buying and exchanging ideas. If there's an economic product that comes out of it, that's great, provided that the money trickles back down to the artist. And A is just, just being A, and thank God that he is. Michelle's hovering in an ominous sort of five to twelve sort of way. I wanted to just say something. Okay. Before. I don't know if there's any more questions. Uh, Est-ce qu'il y a des questions en français, des commentaires en français, non? Et ça? Well, I want to thank both of you. Really, um, uh, all you've said and also the comments from the audience have been really interesting. And in fact. Uh, reiterates for me the importance of thinking of the present through the past and the past through the present and how important context is in the interfacing of the context of today's art world and the art world of the 70s for instance and you know, to bring them face to face is, we try and do that here um, not always as much as we'd like to do it but I think it's very important I mean I feel that your presence here in this seminar and the talk yesterday is kind of a form of support for uh, the programming we do, so I thank you for that. <laughs> and uh, I maybe should mention, should I mention Marina, the February? She, uh, yeah, and Martha will be coming back in February, on February 19th. Uh, there is a colloquium uh, that is called Compulsive Browse that is organized by um, Rebecca Duco and the uh, Fofa Gallery, the Fofa Gallery, uh, gallery in the EV building. And uh, Martha um, is, it, it will be looking at new forms of research, artistic research. And uh, Martha will be here on Saturday, the 19th, at 5 o'clock, and she'll be speaking about um, research and feminism. Right. So you're all welcome to that. It's open to everyone. Thank you. Thank you.